Yeah, on the on the average, I would say what I came across was between six and a half to eight foot tall, the brown or the black. In the east, the Minerva monster, Momo, the Sister Lakes creature, a lot of those creatures have hair all over their face. And it's almost as if the Eastern Bigfoot is a little farther away, is a little more vi invisible to the eyewitnesses than the Western. Last time I talked to someone that claimed to have a like be having activity down here, it was 2007, uh, and it's a, a, a doctor that owns property along St. Peter's Church, which is going to run. We're going to cut over to it in a minute, but okay. she they were having sightings regularly. They they lived um, on a fairly large horse ranch. They, they owned horses and had a ranch and there the activity was so frequent that she told us that they would wake up in the morning for breakfast and these things would be in their backyard my name is seth breedlove in 2005 i became interested in the unexplained when i began investigating a series of bizarre animal mutilations taking place near the small town in which i'd grown up What happened is I talked to that doctor who claimed to have seen something back here. And I started kind of trying to figure out what the history of the area was. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I thought was if there's someone having a sighting back here, there's got to be other people having sightings. So I started driving these roads just because I didn't, I was just getting into it. I'd never interviewed anyone. I didn't know how that stuff worked. Mm -hmm. I didn't have contacts. So like I would just drive the roads. And this one time I was driving down here and there was like an elderly couple that was walking along here. And I asked them, I saw them, I pulled over and I asked them like if they'd ever encountered anything. And they started telling me about all these dead animals they had been finding on their property, like deer ripped in half, stuffed up in trees, the hides, the hides are like ripped out. And what was really- As a documentary filmmaker, that, my primary task is to remain objective, to remove myself from the stories I'm telling and let the subjects themselves carry the film. But there's a part of me that is always curiously seeking the answer to the mysteries at the heart of my films. Do upright walking giants exist? Despite covering a multitude of topics in the films I've made, this is the question to which I always return. So I've decided to set out on a journey for myself. One that isn't solely based around documenting fascinating local legends, but also in getting to the bottom of the reality behind those legends. Bigfoot into the whole phenomenon took place right here. You can see why it would be. Like you said, it's rugged, the ravines are really deep. It's not what you think of when you no. say Northeast Ohio, that's for sure. Mark Matsky is one of the most knowledgeable people I've ever met on the Bigfoot topic. Mark is a Lutheran minister who has a skeptical, level-headed approach to the subject and an encyclopedic knowledge of events and figures that form the foundation of the phenomenon. Okay. The history of Bigfoot reports in newspapers going back to the 1800s has uh, has morphed over time. At first they were described largely in terms of the wild man, but that started to change over time. Part of that I think had to do with the introduction of the discovery of the gorilla 
much of the time the, the language of like a gorilla or like an ape started to replace the language of the wild man. Maybe there's no better person to explain the centuries of history related to undiscovered creatures than Lauren Coleman. Lauren runs a museum dedicated to the subject of cryptozoology in Portland, Maine. Cryptozoology is, of course, the study of unknown animals, of which there are said to be many. But Lauren himself was once just an answer seeker. His investigations into the unexplained led him to write numerous books on the paranormal, and his vast array of knowledge on these subjects opens a door into just how long people have been seeing shadowy beings in the forests behind their homes. Before the Bigfoot word was used, newspaper reporters, eyewitnesses, everybody involved with this phenomena, including native peoples, had to use other words. Those words included things like wild man, a lot of newspaper reports from the 1920s back to the 1860s talk about wild men. It, some of the 1924 newspaper reports talk about forest giants or forest devils. So everybody used different words to try to capture something that today we know entirely as Bigfoot. Bigfoot is a word that's used in Canada, Russia, China, everywhere, and it's became, become the global word to deal with hairy hominids. While Lauren Coleman has made cryptozoology his career, David Floyd has observed the subject as a hobby while maintaining a distinguished academic career as a professor with a specialty in English literature at Charleston Southern University. For David, the pursuit is less about proof of the existence of an unknown animal and more about the quest to further understand humankind's own obsession with things that go bump in the night. So the interesting thing to me about the whole Bigfoot legend is that typically in you know, you've got mythology that explains nature and human nature, and their story is to sort of explain wh why things work the way they do. Um, or you've got folklore that's more of like cautionary tales to tell kids not to wander out into the forest and all. Bigfoot doesn't seem to really serve a purpose uh, culturally. You know, our culture doesn't really need it. Um, I don't think psychologically we necessarily need the idea of an ape f figure walking in the, in the woods. As a former newspaper reporter myself, when I first became interested in the Bigfoot subject, it was the very early newspaper articles that talked of hairy wild men living in forests around the country that piqued my interest. The figures being described in terms of just long-haired humans, in some cases even wearing clothing, living off almost in a hermit-like fashion. The, the ones that I think researchers are more interested in are ones that where there's actually less of a, a sensational nature, where the figure is just searching for food, the figure is just coming close to shelters and homes, uh, either for opportunistic finding of food or just trying to find some easy shelter for the night. Gala Police Ohio is excited over a wild man who is reported to haunt the woods near that city. He goes naked, is covered with hair, is gigantic in height, and his eyes start from the sockets. He attacked a carriage containing a man and his daughter a few days ago. He is said to have bounded at the father, catching him in a grip like that of a vice, and hurling him upon the earth, falling upon him and endeavoring to bite and scratch him like a wild animal. Just as he was about to become exhausted from exertion, the daughter, taking courage of the imminent danger of her parent, snatched up a rock and hurling at the head of her father's would-be murderer, was fortunate enough to put an end to the struggle by striking him somewhere about the ear. Following it, other reports spring up around the state of Ohio, as well as other newspapers across the United States. So I guess if we think about the wild man reports of the 1800s, maybe in the newspapers, those probably didn't hurt in selling newspapers, and that was probably something that people looked forward to reading, as well as maybe addressed a fear that pioneers might have had going out into this unknown wilderness. I think one of the, the things that you have to take into account when you're talking about these early reports is the fact that, like today, uh, newspapers were in the business of selling papers, and so they would find themselves on a low news day having to, at the very least, embellish some reports that may have come in about a, a strange sighting of a weird figure in the woods. Even in terms of English language newspapers, that's where you have the wild man reports 
1869 in Kansas, you had a groups of wild man reports. You had uh, in Whaling River, uh, New York, you have accounts in the 1930s of ape-like creatures in the woods there. In Illinois and Indiana and Ohio, you have very early reports of some of these creatures, especially around the Ohio River and then down into the south. The consistency of reports is one alarming aspect of the Bigfoot phenomena that needs to be examined closely. It isn't just that there are common physical characteristics of what is being seen, but also behavioral characteristics as well. While this doesn't immediately lead one to the conclusion that an undiscovered animal exists, it does make one at least question the possibilities. But what is being seen? While there are height and weight descriptions that tend to deviate, for the most part, people are seeing a bipedal, ape-like being with an attitude that can shift from elusive to playful to curious at a moment's notice. But more on that later. As with any subject, Bigfoot history has its fair share of key moments, reports that are repeated over and over again as cornerstones of the phenomena. Another of those key moments is a tale that began in the 1920s in the state of Washington, and its biographer is Mark Marcel. We are in southwest Washington. Uh, we are approximately, I'm going to guess, about 60 or 70 miles north of the Columbia River, and we're inland from the Pacific coast. Um, well over probably 100 miles or so. And we're on Mount St. Helens, the one that blew up in 1980 uh, in the southwest um, corner of Washington. So in the 1920s, you've got John W. Burns working with the Chehalis Indians and um, finding out about these hairy man uh, legends. And of course, that's where we get the term Sasquatch uh, from. Um, in 1924, you've got the Ape Canyon incident with um, the, I think they called them uh, devil apes or ape devils. The Ape Canyon story is one that, if you're at all interested in the Bigfoot field, you have to come across at some point. In 1918, a group of miners headed by a guy named Marion Smith, along with mostly family members, started prospecting for gold up along the Lewis River here on the south side of the mountain. And in 1922, had made their way up off the Lewis River and up to a location of what's now called Ape Canyon. They were up here not very long. They started hearing strange noises from ridgetop to ridgetop. They would hear high-pitched whistling, screeching noises from a ridgetop in the middle of the night. Mark has filled in details of the Ape Canyon incident that have perplexed investigators for decades. He's even managed to uncover the actual location of the original cabin itself. In addition to the physical remains of the cabin, he's also pieced together a series of events leading up to the Ape Canyon attack that weren't widely publicized. While I was aware of the Ape Canyon attack, what I had never learned before was that there were multiple incidents involving Fred Beck, Marion Smith, and Leroy Smith that involved not just encounters and sightings of the apes, but at least three incidents in which the miners took shots at them including an incident that occurred the same day as the famed attack. Again, at dusk, Leroy is outside. The creature comes out from the bushes. Leroy takes one shot, but all the rest of the miners are inside the cabin and they start boiling out of there, fully armed, start shooting at this creature. Marion estimated that there were about 16 to 17 rounds that went into this creature within 50 to 75 feet that seemingly didn't affect it one bit. On the last shot, the creature is very is standing very close to the precipice, which drops down 200 feet down into the bottom of Ape Canyon. And the last shot, apparently Fred took it, the creature either crouches down and climbs down or falls over into the canyon. That was shortly before dusk. They're just bedding down and something ends up hitting the cabin really dang hard, like a truck had come barreling down the mountain. Whatever hit the cabin, these guys look out, and it was a full moon, they reported, plenty of light, and they can see five or six or seven of these creatures dancing around in the moonlight, and they start throwing boulders on top of the cabin, rocks, they start pounding, they're trying to pound their way in, they start trying to bust down the door. The guys start ripping apart their beds and using the fur boughs to, to blockade the door. Something is trying to pound their way in. Something is actually digging underneath the cabin 
to try to dig their way through underneath to get inside. The roof wasn't very formidable, so they start shooting through the roof and screaming and yelling, please leave us alone. We're going to leave. Go away. This happens all night long for, say, about four or five hours. Perhaps 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning and all's quiet. They tear apart all their blockade, open the door. Nothing's out there. But all around, there are these very, very large, seemingly huge, huge human footprints. Rocks scattered everywhere. They had a loose pile of, of roofing shakes piled up. And, and someone had used that as a step stool to get up on top of the roof. And those are scattered everywhere, right? Grab the tobacco, grab their guns, and hit the trail. We were very uh, fortunate to have the opportunity to be very close to the site of the Ape Canyon incident uh, just this this past year uh, with Mark Merzel and there's something really about having set foot on that site that gives you new insight into the uh, possibility of creatures living out in that area. What most people don't seem to realize is that the Bigfoot story wasn't born in the 1950s. It's been a part of our culture since the first settlers began making their way into the undiscovered recesses of our nation. The terminology for what people have been seeing has changed, but many of the basics of the phenomena remain the same. When discussing these basics, one of the most reliable sources for them comes in the form of Native American cultural history and legends. Kathy Strain works for the Forest Service as a tribal relations manager and historian in the Stanislaus National Forest in California and has spent decades collecting historical accounts of Bigfoot-type creatures that date back centuries. One of the main reasons I believe that Bigfoot is real outside the fact that I'm a witness is just like every other animal in nature, coyote, condor, eagle, rabbit, they are all within traditional stories of Native American tribes. Bigfoot should be represented in those stories, and he is. But each tribe has a different name, like Hairy Man, or you know, Stone Giant, or all these different names. And they always describe this giant he doesn't wear clothes, he's got big feet. So as far as the Native American uh, hairy man stuff, they seem to fall into two categories. Um, one is sort of this nurturing uh, guardian of the forest that kind of oversees um, the different tribes. And uh, you've got the Dakota tribe, uh, they had the Shia Tonka, uh, which means like elder brother. But then others are these sort of violent cannibals that come down and kidnap children and, and women. and. Um, the Bella Coola tribe has the, the Bok or the Skookum uh, that means uh, evil genie. Um, the Iroquois has this, the stone man that evidently was human at one time but was cursed uh, to be this uh, sort of forest dweller. What are some of your favorite sort of historical accounts of Bigfoot type people? Well, a lot of those are Native American type stories that I think are my, some of my most favorite, but more of the more recent kind of historical accounts, um, the Osman account is I found very intriguing. And at first it's it's so outlandish because it's a man who was out uh, trapping in the remote areas of British Columbia in Canada. He had noticed something sniffing around his camp and, and he decided one night that he was gonna stuff some food, some tobacco and his, his gun into his pack with him. And some time along that that night, um, he gets picked up by something thrown over its shoulder like a sack of potatoes, and he rode for hours in this very uncomfortable position with his knees up. He was dumped out on the ground and he noticed that he was in a canyon, but he also started noticing that the individual that had carried him was an old male hairy forest giant. He also started looking around and saw that there was a old female. Off in the bushes, he noticed there was a young female and also a young male. What are these things? What are they doing? They're, they're chit-chatting to each other in the language he doesn't understand. But it was very, very clear that any time he tried to make a move to leave the area, he was being stopped either by the male figure he considered the father or the female that he considered the mother. So for three days, he stayed in the the canyon and he started interacting with the old male. And it's an opening for him to escape. So he grabs his gun, what le is left of the rations that he had brought with him, and he makes a mad dash for it. He didn't tell the story to anybody for many years. He kept it to himself because he figured everybody would think he was crazy until finally John Green, 
got him to tell him the story and had him sign an affidavit that everything that he had said was true. Accounts like the Ostman encounter or Abe Canyon are important because, like so many early tales, details cited by witnesses from years gone by are recounted often in modern day sightings as well. The rock throwing, bizarre vocalizations, and general physical descriptions have been noted by dozens of other eyewitnesses of Bigfoot even up to today. While discovering the body of an ape at the actual location of the Ape Canyon incident is unlikely, simply learning if there was a cabin in that location would help corroborate some details and cement the story's place in history. I brought my file with me, it's about three inches thick, of interviews with these miners that were done at the time. And at the time, directly after the attack, all the miners did say, I don't care how much gold is up there, I'm never going back. One thing about mining law at the time is that in order to continue proofing your claim, um, you had to file what was known as a proof of labor and file it with the county. And they filed one in Scamania County. And it was done in September, about two months after the incident. In that, that proof of labor, they said that all work was completed on July the 10th, 1924. July the 10th, 1924 was the night of the attack and they never went back. In addition to mountains of paperwork, in recent years, Mark has managed to discover the actual location of where the Ape Canyon cabin itself once stood. But what else can we learn from these historical reports? Just how widespread were they, and how can we possibly corroborate the veracity of the events in question? With the entire subject of cryptozoology being looked at as little more than a simple diversion, or worse, a laughing stock. What good does it do to ask questions of the past while seeking answers in the present? The real takeaway from looking into these historical reports seems to be that the people who claimed an encounter that has since become just another legend went to their grave without ever seeing the mystery solved. I like the subject of Yeti and Bigfoot studies because it's a mystery. It's about animals. Uh, and it's just that we haven't discovered these primates. And the other big thing to me is that it's a way in which something that's almost human but not human is just barely beyond our consciousness. The documents are still there waiting in the file um, in courthouses and libraries and historical societies, and these stories need to be researched again. There is an animal out here, nobody seems to know what it is. How do we study that and, and make it a reality? But it was also the folklore part, part of it, of, of every part of this country has a different story and a different name. Native Americans had traditional beliefs. It wasn't something that just popped up in the 1950s when, when Jerry Crew found those first footprints. It was something that's always been out there. The appeal to me of the Bigfoot topic is the consistency of accounts of it throughout legends and folklore and literature and, and that type of thing, um, even previous to any photographic um, evidence of it. Just that idea of, of a consistent theme throughout um, is, is interesting to me. If you went down and talked to farmers on that road today, they're probably similar to what people are reporting in that area today. Like you've got the the consistency of like this animal that wants to stay hidden, that people see trying to stay hidden, that occasionally will commit some sort of <laughs> terrifying, you know, like the Gallup police sighting from the right. 1800s where it attacks someone. Mm -hmm. it, it, and then you've got the rock throwing and things like that that we see popping up in reports like the Minerva case from the 70s. There's a lot of similarities in these reports and, and those consistencies are something I've always found interesting. Yeah, And that makes you wonder how many of these reports are going on in places where there's a historical sort of uh, a pattern of these these sightings taking place, how many of them go unreported and in, and therefore never reach any kind of main, not mainstream, but like any kind of recognition. People just don't want the attention yeah. in their own backyard. Yep. Now 
Northern America is full of folk tales, lore, and legends. Few of these resonate with us still today in the way that Bigfoot does. Sightings still occur in the vast wilderness in the nation's forests, in wooded areas behind suburban homes, and in farmers' fields. Fittingly, for a subject that has only grown in stature over the centuries, these modern-day encounters bear startling similarities to those from years past. Perhaps the reason is simply a cultural manifestation of our own memories of stories we heard as children, or maybe, lurking in the darkness, there does exist something real, something unseen that wishes to remain that way. The Last Great Mystery The real research happens on the backside of that camera, up in the mountains and in these areas. And, and one of the key things to this research, uh, I found, is staying in one area for a lengthy period of time. Because too oh, many people, too many people, um, you know, back, you know, when this, the research kind of started, it was, and Derek could tell you better than I can, but it was, okay, here's an encounter, let's go there. Here's an encounter, let's go there. Here's an encounter, here's a story. I don't think people really appreciate, the, you know, uh, how hard this research is and how difficult it is. And when you get out there, you're looking for something, or at least researching something that's obviously highly intelligent, a master of its environment, and probably really doesn't want to be found. I think they can stay fairly isolated without any human contact, especially in areas like this. I mean, out here between Northern California and, and, and BC, there's what, 56 missing planes, <laughs> which are stationary and people can't find them. Imagine a moving needle in a haystack. Good luck. Growing up, when I heard the word Bigfoot, I thought of the Pacific Northwest. It wasn't until my late teens that I heard about sightings taking place on the East Coast, and I distinctly remember finding the entire idea vaguely ridiculous. It wasn't that the idea of the creature existing was itself ridiculous. I just couldn't comprehend how something said to be as large as a Sasquatch could remain undetected in the forests of states like Ohio or New York. But the PNW? Well, that made sense. Pinned in by mountains and sea, the Pacific Northwest is a corridor extending through the states of Northern California, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon, eventually coming to an unofficial border somewhere in British Columbia. It's an area brimming with wildlife, water sources, dense vegetation, and seemingly endless acres of unexplored forests. Oh, and few people, making it all the more appealing to an animal said to be fiercely antisocial. In 2018, I made my way out to the Pacific Coast. I spent three days traveling the states of Washington and Oregon, seeing everything I could from the Cascades to the Olympics. What struck me most was that at first blush, it was just like forested, mountainous areas I visited on the other side of the country, only bigger. So much bigger. In the Olympic National Forest, I met up with Shane Corson and Derek Randalls of the Olympic Project. Just tell me, uh, starting with you, uh, just tell me your names and what you do and a little bit about the organization. Uh, my name is Derek Randalls. I'm the co-founder of the Olympic Project. The Olympic Project was started about 10 years ago and it started as a, like a pretty comprehensive camera trap program. And what we did is we would take predatory travel routes, ridge lines elk calving areas, things of that nature, and we would camera trap them. Uh, my name is Shane Corson, um, one of the core members of the Olympic Project. And uh, basically, like as Derek said here, you know, we're just trying to gather as much data as we can. This phenomenon, this Bigfoot phenomenon, I think requires that, that, uh, that approach. And we got a really good group uh, of, of, of biologists, scientists, laymen, trackers, hunters, uh, and uh, we all get it going great, and it's a uh, you know it's a blast doing this type of research. Completely dead on the other side, it's like you know misty, it's creepy, and it's just hmm. literally you can step over into it. People misconstrue what we're trying to do. We're not trying to prove Bigfoot's real. Everybody in the Olympic Project pretty much has had an experience or a sighting, and we're kind of in the knowing camp. We're trying to do as much documentation as we can of evidence, and what we're trying to do is develop patterns. And it's a long shot, but if we can get enough patterns developed over time then we might start being able to work towards predictability. 
which is like how you know Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey got as, has had as much success as they had. One of my goals is to make this less taboo and get more science involved. And by doing that, is is uh, you know we got tons of stories, anecdotal stories out there. Um, you got to document. You got to present stuff to science that they'll accept. And right now, that's what we've been working on for years. And we got a great body of, of data and evidence. So uh, I would like to make it less taboo and get uh, get science to look at this a little more serious as a whole. Where we focus our research is the northern, the northern part of the Olympics. One of the reasons I think that uh, this makes such perfect Bigfoot habitat is you can step 10 feet off the highway and you're you're gone. You're not going to be seen if you don't want to be seen. Uh, so the geography here just plays into being able to house a creature like this very easily. It's an abundance of food, whether you want to fish or hunt or eat uh, berries. many berries. Uh, um, there's just a, a ton of food out here. And so it'd be easy for us to, to survive out here. Um, and something such as a Sasquatch could thrive out here and never be seen um, year round. Investigators such as Derek and Shane aren't simply picking a random spot on a map to conduct their research. They're doing it directly in Bigfoot's own backyard, a place as inseparable from the lore as the tracks the creature is said to leave behind. Speaking of those tracks, it's perhaps due to the popularity of another large hairy creature making footprints that the Bigfoot subject would grow to such prominence in the 1950s. A small band of men on a perilous search for the man-beast of Tibet. The abominable snowman of the Himalayas. You've heard of him, haven't you? The word abominable snowman came about in 1921 in Nepal through a an Indian newspaper reporter who mistranslated a word from that area of the Himalayas where these reports were coming out of. Here you have the merging of the old reports of wild men and Sasquatch and different things like that occurring in America where some people will start using the word abominable snowman of America. While the Yeti was leaving footprints in the snow across the Himalayas, road crews in Northern California began discovering tracks of their own. Accompanying these print finds were stories from skittish loggers and construction workers of encounters with huge hairy beings in the uninhabited sectors currently being cleared as part of a logging boom. In 1957, a man named Jerry Crew would unwittingly create a media frenzy around the unknown track maker that would soon be dubbed Bigfoot. The story of Jerry Crew is in almost every way the story of the birth of Bigfoot as we know it. Because of how his story hit the news, sort of the images that were associated with the search ever since. The Six Rivers National Forest was one of the last of those forests to open itself up to logging. Jerry Crew was working on a contract to build some of those logging roads into the forest to begin that process. He would work and then leave his equipment and the next day he kept finding these large footprints around his equipment. So finally he decides he's going to cast one of the most beautiful footprints there are and it gets into the national press and the term Bigfoot gets coined. With the term Bigfoot slowly overtaking the Yeti in the pop cultural lexicon, reports of encounters with man-like apes in the forested regions of the Pacific Northwest began to increase. While sightings of these creatures have been taking place for decades, they had never been treated with any degree of legitimacy, and certainly no one had ever bothered to put any effort into actually attempting to scientifically approach the search. Today, groups like the Olympic Project can find private donors or raise funding through its growing base of researchers, but at a time when there was no acceptance for even the possibility of Bigfoot's existence in the public eye, funds were non-existent. Until Tom Slick. One of the things that was missing from some of the early searches for the Yeti uh, was good funding. Along comes uh, Texas oil and beef millionaire Tom Slick saw that it would be a lot easier if he could conduct these research and these expeditions in the Americas. So he transferred the whole operation over to California and British Columbia uh, in the beginning of the 60s. The early days of Sasquatch research were dominated by four men. 
Individuals who, over time, became inextricably linked to the subject and did more to further it and help us understand it than nearly anyone. John Green, Grover Krantz, Rene de Hinden, and Peter Byrne. In 1999, filmmaker Peter von Puttkammer set out to make a film documenting the search for Bigfoot, and in so doing, he created a valuable look at the four horsemen and how they interacted with and viewed one another. So Rene de Hinden, obviously they all had great personalities, really interesting. Rene de Hinden was kind of the gadfly of the group. He was the one who came out and he was critical, but he always, he always took him with a grain of salt. And he had a great sense of humor and he was quick with the wisecracks. And basically people really loved him. He was the irascible guy in the Bigfoot circuit. Rene de Hinden had one goal in mind, and that was to find the answer, to find the creature itself. And if he had to befriend these other researchers in order to do that, that was fine, but not necessary. John Green was very much a, he was a newspaper man and he wanted just the facts. He was one of the first people that ever published anything. And most people, the introduction to Bigfoot is John Green's initial books from Washington, Oregon, British Columbia. You know, Peter Byrne, of course. And Peter was an amazing, raconteur and true adventurer and an actual hunting guide and true tracker hunter. He was a big game hunter from um, Nepal and had a quite the stellar uh, reputation. I think his importance stems from the fact that he was out there leading the charge. You know, he very much had that persona of the uh, wilderness hunter. And Dr. Grover Krantz is the only academic to really throw his hat in at the ring at the time. What Krantz was able to do is utilize um, the resources that were at his disposal and some of the connections that he had in order to take a anthropological and biological look at the things that he could get his hands on. He always fought, you know, uh, the, the, the academics, you know, who just thought it was ludicrous that he was studying this at all. During the 60s and 70s, the four horsemen would offer more to the burgeoning field of unknown primates in North America than nearly anyone, taking part in massive and smaller scale expeditions and investigations across the Pacific Northwest. Krantz, Green, DeHinden, and Byrne would cast tracks, take sighting reports, and stalk their unseen prey in hopes of solving the Bigfoot riddle once and for all. Ironically, None of them would ever claim a sighting of the creature they spent their lives in pursuit of, and over time, their relationships with one another would fall apart. John Green said that, how could all of these egos fit in one room? And they all had to have enormous egos to keep on the hunt, to really have all those distractors and skeptics, uh, you know, at bay all the time. The relationship between all of them was tenuous. Tenuous at best, that's part of what intrigued me about the story, is that you had four men that had spent a lifetime looking for a monster in the woods, and yet most of their time was spent arguing with each other. So John Green and Rene de Hinden were very close for a long time, and then Rene, who became a very crusty sort of individual, kind of pushed John away. Peter Byrne and John Green never liked each other. And then Grover Krantz uh, got angry at all of them. Rene de Hinden very famously uh, criticized Grover Krantz for being, you know, a stick in the mud and, and all of this. Rene thought most of the scientific stuff was blown out of proportion and, you know, he hadn't done the, the, the field work that Rene had done. He hadn't lived in tents out in the forest and it was all academic and in his mind. Now it's 2018, three of them are dead and Peter Byrne is outliving everyone. And those that outlive all of the emperors get to write the history. And it's kind of intriguing to watch what's going on. The early days of investigation into the subject aren't all that different from today. For the most part, the few researchers that did actively take part in the search for answers merely responded to sightings by arriving at the location where they'd taken place and trying to collect any evidence that might remain, occasionally spending a few days in the field hoping for a sighting of their own. In the decade following the Jerry Crew track find, only the Patterson-Gimlin film would, in any meaningful way, help propel the hunt forward. Yet even the PGF would offer little more than a fascinating document of a purported creature. 
Shot in 1967, the Patterson-Gimlin film is as debated today as it was when it was first shown. From the Jerry Crew discovery until the early 1970s, Bigfoot remains solely a product of the West Coast, with numerous discoveries, expeditions, and sightings occurring in the PNW. Bigfoot are mainly seen from Northern California to Southern Alaska. That's the concentration, the Pacific Northwest. The Pacific Northwest would seem to be the perfect place for an undiscovered large primate to hide. There's a variety of reasons for that, beginning with the uh, terrain itself. You have mountain ranges, some of them extremely rugged, occupying hundreds upon hundreds of square miles. We had folks, early researchers like John Green and Roger Patterson and Rene de Hinden chasing down all of these reports. A lot of them came from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, there were quite a few where regular campers to a report I have um, up on the Olympic Peninsula of a deputy sheriff running across one. Bob Strain is a retired firefighter paramedic who teaches an EMT class. He lives with his wife Kathy in Northern California and has spent more time outdoors in the mountainous terrains that Bigfoot is said to call home than nearly anyone I've come across. Can you tell me about that? Sure. Well, um, the first experience that I had with uh, what we call Bigfoot was in 1975. I had just graduated high school and I went on a elk hunting trip with my dad and we had been hunting for a couple of days and I was up on a ridge. My dad was supposed to be uh, coming up an opposing ridge and we were gonna try to kick up some game to each other and I saw something black come out into the open. It's probably three, 400 yard distance that I'm looking at, but it was unobstructed view. First I thought it was a bear and it came across the hillside and was hiding behind some trees and some rocks. I had a clear shot and I had, uh, you know, a deer rifle and I was watching it through my scope and it was on all fours, like I said. Got up to this flat area and it's, I was just about to take the shot, it was in my crosshairs, and uh, it stood up on two legs. And it kind of freaked me out a little bit. Well, it confused me as to exactly what it was I was looking at. And I walked off on two legs, the, the hunched over uh, cross country skier type walking motion. And I watched it w walk away. So the entire sighting, two or three minutes. And then I'm looking through my binoculars, my dad had finally come out uh, from the forest where this thing had emerged from. But I could see him looking for me and he got on his walkie talkie. Who's over there with you? There's some big, huge guy with you. I said, son, there's nobody over here but me. And I said, well, there is some big dude all dressed in black right above you. Uh, August, 2011, I was re remote backpacking Mount Hood Wilderness with two friends of mine, uh, work buddies. And we had made camp at this remote lake Around 1.32 in the morning, I, I'm awoken. I wake up to what sounds like two rocks being smashed together, and it's from a distance, and it's getting closer and closer. My buddy Mitch, who was next to me, asked me, hey, do you hear that? And I said, yeah, I hear that. And he said, what is that? I said, I don't know. Um, and we hear something moving up on this little bit of a hillside. It, it sounded bipedal, but I, I couldn't tell. And to be honest, I didn't really want to look. And all of a sudden, whack, whack, five times. These, the, they're so hard to explain. The most powerful knocks I've ever heard or felt in my life because you could feel them in your tent. They literally shook the ground. So whatever it was, was close. And it got silent. And then through the trees, we hear something coming through high above us through the trees. You hear it hitting branches, duh, 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 thud. Lands next to my buddy, Mitch's tent. And he goes, you know what that was, right? I said, that was a rock. I unzip the tent, I'm looking around. Now out of the corner of my eye, I see something swing from behind a tree. And it looks like it's looking directly at our camp. And it's just swaying. It's got its, and I can see a hand on the front of this large uh, pine, and it's just doing this back and forth, back and forth. And I can make out the arm and the shoulder and the head, and, and I could tell it was massive. But it eventually took off, and we peeled out. As soon as it was daylight, we packed up and got out of there. And we were uh, going to do four days, and we ended up doing two. 
I was an investigator with the BFRO for several years as well, and I talked to a lot of different people. And I have friends that are, you know, who you would call very credible people, law enforcement officers. You know, being from California, I've talked to several California Highway Patrol who have had visual sightings, and they identified it specifically as the only thing it could be is a Bigfoot. Uh, a really typical report is, hey, I was driving to work four o'clock in the morning between Port Angeles and Forks, and this eight foot tall creature on two legs ran in front of the car. That's super typical. Well, the majority of, uh, of reports are roadside crossings. Well, at any given moment, there's more people driving than are out camping, hiking, and, and you're observant when you're driving. When you're out camping and stuff, you're usually into yourself, into you know what you're doing. I think Sasquatch could be around you and you would never know because they're very predictable and they just wanna skirt around you and avoid you. Over 60 years have passed since Jerry Crew came across a strangely huge footprint in the dirt in Northern California. During that time, the field of Sasquatch study has seen its fair share of new faces and additional evidence has come in by the truckload, much of it from findings in the Pacific Northwest. And while the world has changed dramatically, the farthest reaches of the West Coast remain essentially the same as they were in the 1960s. And while Grover Krantz, John Green, and Rene de Hinden didn't have a sighting of their own, the creature they searched for continues to be seen, and investigators like Derek and Shane follow in their footsteps occasionally walking the same ground that the pioneers of the subject once walked themselves, though for different reasons than the cantankerous four horsemen. It's because it's, it keeps me in the woods. It's, it's the ultimate hunt, and I'm a hunter. And even though we're not hunting with rifles, we're hunting for answers. And these answers are answers that everybody's looking for. And it's not that we want to be first with the answers, just want the answers. I, lo I love it because I just love to be in the woods. I mean, I, I mean, I, I know Sasquatch exists. It's not even a, it's a non-issue for me. Uh, I, I'm, you know, some people come out here to find themselves. Some people come out here to lose themselves. I come out here for answers and to be in nature, you know, um, and I can escape this guy because the mountain's right there and I'm a little bit faster than him. <laughs> so I can go, you know, bye-bye. No. But. <laughs> I didn't make the trek to Washington with the expectation that it would find proof of the existence of undiscovered ape men, and in that regard my approach was the right one. But I did leave with a greater understanding of the area that we now consider the birthplace of Bigfoot. An expanse so large in scale that it's difficult to describe through words. I came away from the Pacific Northwest with a sense of just how much the quest to find the creature has impacted the lives of those who take part in the search. And now, months after I last set foot somewhere within the murky boundaries of America's last frontier, I find myself wondering if maybe the search for Sasquatch is motivated as much by a desire to explore the wilds as it is to find the answers to a centuries-old question. Don't go out in the woods after dark or the Minerva monster will get you. I heard it a thousand times as a kid, but never understood what it meant. Minerva was a small town that was a 20 minute drive from my own small town. My dad and mom used to take us there for dinner when I was little. Why on earth did such a normal place have such a weird mascot? Years would pass before I learned the story behind the Minerva monster legend. How it centered around one small family living just off the Lincoln Highway outside of town, who were stalked by a mysterious creature in the forest behind their home during the summer of 1978. It was another handful of years before I would set out to document that story for my first film, Minerva Monster. The person I contacted when I began researching the Minerva Monster case was Barbara Galloway. Barbara was a beat reporter who was tasked with covering the monster story when it was first reported. When you were when you first got tasked with covering the Minerva monster story, what were you told about the story going into it? Oh, it was uh, simply a correspondent had picked up this uh, police report at the sheriff's department and uh, I needed to go check it out because it was quite bizarre. 
and it sounded to them like they had seen this new creature. That's what I was curious about. Is like, was was Bigfoot even in? It wasn't even a word. Were the, yeah, were there Bigfoot reports <laughs> taking place here, or was this kind of like, in your opinion, was this one of the the first ones to kind of catapult it into the one of the east first? Coast. Okay. Yeah, in the East Coast, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, all we knew about Bigfoot is that there was this video from the West, from Washington State or somewhere. Yeah, and um, the, the name Bigfoot had just gotten started; it wasn't even a thing yet. I did it as a legitimate story, and you well, know, and you didn't you didn't refer to it as Bigfoot. No, and they never did. Yeah, they never did, and they referred it to it as the hairy creature or the the large creature or something like that. There's a real evolution in the media interest. Uh, in the 1950s, it was all about flying saucers and strange phenomena to do with UFOs, and then you see. It, in the late 60s after the Patterson-Gimlin film and around the time of the Boggy Creek movie that the thrill of monsters came to the newspaper headlines and a lot of newspaper editors wanted to sell papers, wanted people to pick up their newspapers, so it was monster this, monster that. After the Jerry Crew stories hit the papers, there was a growing sense that various locations had their own histories of Sasquatch and Bigfoot reports, where all of a sudden stories were coming out of the general Midwest, coming out of the South, and even the East Coast and the extreme Northeast part of the United States. If Patterson-Gimlin film is in 1967, you know, you're, you're at the end of a very tumultuous decade where there's lots of sort of cultural upheaval and all that. And you go into the 70s that is kind of trying to reconcile all of that chaos that came before it. And I think the popularity of something like Bigfoot seems to play into this cultural interest in people's darker nature. Minerva was a microcosm for the United States as a whole. Suddenly, a phenomenon that was supposed to be taking place solely in the Pacific Northwest had made a home in our own backyards. Literally. Stories about the Minerva monster and the Big Muddy Monster were grabbing attention not just because of the headlines associated with them, but also because various elements of them seem ripped from the pages of a dime store horror novel. Tales of marauding creatures annihilating household pets and terrifying teenagers in parked cars were now all the rage. The Falk Monster, the Missouri Monster, Monroe Monster, Big Head, the Enfield Horror, and more began appearing in local papers across the U.S., in many ways mirroring tales of encounters with wild men and apes seen in some of the very same publications a century earlier. With the spread of Bigfoot reports, the number of people interested in finding the creature began to grow as well. In New York, investigators like Bill Brand began looking into the subject with great interest, while in Ohio, Don Keating started taking reports from locals of what he began in to call Ohio the Buckeye at that Bigfoot. Point, was Bigfoot even a thing, or was that kind of like when it was just first starting to come into the public eye? When did it really like come into the public eye? Uh, Bigfoot in Ohio was like a roller coaster ride. Sometimes you would hear a lot about it, and other times you'd go for months or years without hearing anything at all. And so you had Minerva and MacArthur taking place in the late 70s, but nothing had taken place up until the mid 80s when I happened to come across this information. As a kid, I was always aware of Keating. As one of the first Ohio Bigfoot investigators, he'd had a hand in looking into infamous cases like the Rome, Ohio flap, and of course, the Minerva monster case. Though the Minerva monster sightings took place prior to his time as an investigator, his research into it pointed towards some of the commonalities that ran across many Bigfoot encounters in the northeast part of the U.S. Yeah, on the, on the average, I would say what I came across was between six and a half to eight foot tall, the brown or the black. In the east, the Minerva monster, Momo, the Sister Lakes creature, a lot of those creatures have hair all over their face and it's almost as if the Eastern Bigfoot is a little farther away, is a little more vi invisible to the eyewitnesses than the Western. Yeah, geographical differences in what the creature was actually being reported as did seem to have sort of a, a regional cast to them. It seemed like a lot of the 
Midwest report seem to be seven to eight feet tall and very, very hairy to the degree that often the face would be obscured by the hair that was growing over it. I had one report that stuck out, stood out uh, from Guernsey County, Ohio, not too far from Kimbolton, of some fellows who were back in the woods that were clear cutting an area. They happened to run across one of these things that was dark brown or black in color, but the entire stomach and chest area was white. That wasn't unusual enough. They just seen it and they said, that's it, we're out of here. You know, because they ran across something that they didn't think existed and scared them, frankly. Well, what's interesting about a country as big as the United States is you seem to have these different species or variants of what Bigfoot is. You know, in the, in the Northwest, it seems to be this kind of docile creature just, just kind of wanders about. Uh, whereas in Florida, you've got the skunk ape that seems particularly aggressive. There are accounts, I think, in the Northeast of, of white-haired Bigfoot. In September of 85, outside of Newcomerstown, just south of the Tuscarawas Guernsey County line on County Road 33, as you head toward a tiny little dot on the map called Guernsey, we had been out there investigating repeated sightings, screams, and the glowing eye incidents. There were four of us out there. We had been playing recorded sounds of what a, allegedly a Sasquatch sounds like. The guy who was over by the old barn didn't tell, of course, it didn't, we didn't know this until later, but he had heard noises coming off the hillside like heavy walking, heavy footfalls. And a short time later, as we found out, is when I seen something walking towards a chicken pen, it stopped for a split second and then walked away, straight away from me, twice as fast as it had come down toward the chicken pen. And what I could tell with what ambient light that I had was that it was a light colored individual easily twice as tall as what the goldenrod was because it appeared as if the waist was above the goldenrod weeds. Pacific Northwest, you have a lot of people that f compare Bigfoot to the mountain gorilla. And that very much is in contrast to the Eastern Bigfoot, really starting from the 60s, where there was violent interactions and it seems like a lot of these Northeast reports had sort of an aggressive nature to them, that the, the sightings or the, the things that were being reported were not something that you would want to see uh, coming close to you. Often there's a sense of, uh, you know, a war or a, a violation of space that was taking place. Uh, but the major difference that a lot of people always can see is that the Eastern Bigfoot tend to attack dogs. And dogs become the victims of Bigfoot in a lot of these stories, not in the West, but certainly in the East. When we interviewed a family, they'd had six uh, dogs taken from their, some of them were pit bulls, taken, ripped, the chains are ripped. I mean, it's not, I've done films with <laughs> cougar attacks and coyote attacks and wild dogs in general will just tear an animal apart, but we're talking about something that has torn a heavy chain with the dog. There have also been decapitations. You try and put a human in the yard, you're not going to get close to that dog. So what's doing it? It's not indicative of any animal, and they're disappearing at, you know, a regular rate. As far as differentials uh, in behavior, the one down in the Bulgy Creek area, Falk, Arkansas, seem to be more aggressive. There have been maybe a handful of reports in Pennsylvania that indicate it could be a little more aggressive over in that part of the state. Eric Altman and Stan Gordon would have a lot more info on that. Ohio is just, what I know, is just a mainly passive, non-aggressive creature uh, roaming the woods. The aggressiveness of the Minerva monster was downplayed by the Catons, who, despite the suspected killing of their dog, believed it to be a passive creature something echoed by many Ohio investigators when it came to Bigfoot behavior as reported by the majority of witnesses. Maybe it was simply the more dramatic encounters that tended to make the news which painted the creatures into a violent corner. Regardless, the direction the phenomenon would take next would make the destruction of pets and livestock by creatures across the Midwest and Northeast look relatively normal by comparison. The Rome, Ohio incidents in 1981. Um, 
that was a totally bizarre set of circumstances. Apparent three-toed tracks all over the place and alleged UFO Bigfoot connections, which oh, my own opinion is you have to show it to me to convince me that it actually is connected. But they allegedly were having an awful lot of reports up there of UFOs and Bigfoot connected. And that was in 1981, just a few years before I got into it. It was Pennsylvania researcher Stan Gordon who first brought to the public's attention the correlation between UFOs and Bigfoot in the state. I documented a very small part of Stan's work in the Bigfoot and UFO fields in my 2017 film Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, which was also when I first became aware of just how many cases he's investigated in his 60 plus years of paranormal research. While Stan was primarily a UFO investigator at the start, over time he would become intricately tied to the Bigfoot subject and to furthering the idea of a nationwide phenomenon that stretched far beyond the Pacific Northwest. Like, what were people reporting, seeing or encountering? Bigfoot is really nothing new to Pennsylvania. I and mean, there have been reports uh, that apparently are associated with the Native Americans going back many, many years. And there are numerous newspaper accounts from across the state of Pennsylvania that talk about sightings of Bigfoot and strange footprints were found uh, throughout the state. Back in 1973 and 74, all through this area, we experienced first the biggest UFO outbreak and then the biggest Bigfoot outbreak in history that began the summer of 1973, continued to early 1974, with multitudes of Bigfoot sightings, daylight as well as at night. That's when I had my, re my first research teams, mainly scientists, engineers, and research people. And we were on the scene many times within minutes to hours after the incidents occurred. And there was a time in the 70s where UFOs and Bigfoot reports merged. They merged in, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in some of these locations. You would get a lot of eyewitnesses saying that UFOs were involved in some of the uh, craft sightings and that then all of a sudden a Bigfoot would appear. So we were there when we could see the reaction of the witnesses, see their emotion, see the animal reaction in some cases, see the physical evidence at the scene. We made casts of some of the footprints, and it was just an amazing time to live through. It was a case that occurred up in Fayette County, along the ridge, up near Ohio Pile in February 6 of 1974, that was a case that convinced me that there's a lot more to the Bigfoot phenomena than any of us realized. This woman was sitting in a little cabin home deep up in the mountains. She began to hear this commotion on her front porch. She loads her shotgun. She makes her way over to the wall, turns on the switch to turn on the porch light. She makes her way to the front door, opens up the front door, steps outside, and to her surprise, there's no dogs. But only a few feet in front of her, she describes this huge, hairy, covered creature with his arms straight up over its head, just standing there right in front of her. What does she do? She fires her shotgun right at the creature, right into it. She said there's this bright flash of light, like the flash from a camera, and it physically disappears right in front of her. That's not the end of the story, though, because her in-laws lived only about 100 feet away, and they heard the gunshot, and they called and asked, what are you shooting at? And she tried to describe it to him. Her son-in-law at that point grabs his pistol and starts walking up that dark road towards her cabin. He saw a figure running up the road, but as he gets closer, he said he's surrounded by four or five hairy people with eyes like coals of fire. And he runs into the cabin home, and it was around that time period that they see this large object. They saw like a big Christmas ornament with luminous different lights on it that was hovering over the trees at the same time. They, they were very frightened. That's when they called the state police. By the time the state police, some of those National Guardsmen found the property way up in the mountain, whatever was there was gone. Within the Bigfoot field and the UFO field, it's kind of a norm to talk about 80% of the cases are misidentifications, mistakes, 1% are hoaxes. Now, if you take those two bodies of reports and you look at the circle that overlaps, 
you have an even smaller percentage that include UFO reports and Bigfoot reports. While Pennsylvania would eventually become inextricably linked to high strangeness cases connected with Bigfoot, the predominant number of reports were still of seemingly flesh and blood creatures moving through the densely forested sections of the state or occasionally glimpsing crossing a back road late at night. Despite the muddying of the waters brought on by the occasional paranormal Bigfoot case, the mundane sightings and encounters continued to occur weekly, with reports coming to Gordon's UFO hotline with greater frequency. Uh, a lot of these creatures generally range from six to about nine feet tall, even though some smaller ones have been reported. Uh, generally, very, sometimes very broad-shouldered, very long arms, sometimes extending down beyond the knees, almost to the ground in some cases. and. Uh, Many of the Bigfoot reports are in daylight. It seems that some people are of the opinion that Bigfoot is a nocturnal animal, that it's only seen at night. But actually, many of the better sightings here in Pennsylvania are occurring here in daylight. And many have been at very, very close range. From the hills of Ohio to the ridges of Pennsylvania to the Adirondacks of New York, Bigfoot was sweeping the nation, coast to coast. Local legends had begun making some sense when viewed within the phenomena as a whole, perfectly exemplified in tales of a creature said to lurk in the depths of southern swamps. The southern Sasquatch gained further notoriety in the early 70s when it was brought to the silver screen in The Legend of Boggy Creek, a docudrama which focused on an outbreak of Bigfoot sightings in the bogs of Arkansas. Unlike most films connected to the subject, Boggy Creek was based on true events and did more to cement the idea of a living, undiscovered creature wandering the forest than nearly anything in pop culture up to that time. One of the major films for those people that grew up in the 1960s was Legend of Boggy Creek, which came out in 1972. And it really burst on the scene in such a big way and drive-in theaters was so accessible to people and then had a whole TV career too that a lot of individuals that are researchers today uh, really point to that one film. Robert Robinson is an author and adventurer. He currently researches Bigfoot and skunk apes along with other local legends near his home in Florida. The skunk ape, which I always tell everybody, is the cousin of uh, Bigfoot. My research has shown this is basically, seems to be the same animal. This animal uh, tends about eight foot tall. The light brown in hair, I would say, uh, it does seem to have, you know, have no fear of going in the water. Generally speaking, those creatures were sighted in and around swamps or inland lakes. So even the, the nomenclature there of skunk ape suggests a very ape-like appearance and almost a, a great ape or a gorilla shape and size to what was being seen. Uh, down in the swamps. Reports in South Carolina are not as prevalent as, as some other places, but there is a consistency to them uh, in that they tend to be uh, this sort of orange -ish color. Um, they tend to have really long arms, and really the descriptions are consistently like an orangutan. The term skunk cake got used in 1971 when a amateur archaeologist, H.C. Uh, Osborne, saw it out in the Big Cypress Swamp down in the Everglades. It seems like right after that, every uh, newspaper article right after that referred to it as a Florida skunk cake. I'm one of those individuals that tend to think there's a different kind of uh, hairy creature in the South that's more chimpanzees like. Uh, in the Florida, it's called the skunk ape, the Honey Island Swamp Monster, uh, boogers. Uh, all kinds of different names in the South. Those are not traditional Bigfoot. One of the oldest sightings of the Florida Skunk Cape took place in 1941. It was by a five-year-old little boy. And he came in and he told his mom that there was a big hairy monster out there watching him. And he said that and the, the thing was just watching him. And then when he got up and ran inside, it took off walking. And this took place in the big, uh, in the green swamp located out uh, north of Lakeland, Florida. It is the skunk ape, but there are equal number of sightings in Louisiana, in Mississippi, in Oklahoma, Texas, Southeast Texas. You know, there's places called Monster Central along the border of Louisiana and East Texas where there's constant sightings. They do seem to be a little aggressive here, um, whether it's screaming at the person that, that saw them or maybe throwing something. But just like in Florida, the skunk ape tends to be 
somewhat aggressive and, and sort of nasty. Uh, it seems like the ones in, in South Carolina seem to be too. We had a sighting with a, a, a hunter, uh, 2012 Thanksgiving. He uh, it was in a tre uh, tree stand when he saw the animal, as I call it, come walking out into a big, huge palmetto field. And uh, he took out a cell phone and started filming. The thing looked up at him. And he said he felt a chill go down his spine when he realized it wasn't like a guy in a suit or a, a, a hunter in a ghillie suit, that it was a, an animal. He just kind of just didn't know what to do because the thing was looking at him, he was looking at it. And then he you know, didn't know if he you know, should go for his gun or just keep filming. And then he, the thing just quickly just took off running. He said he couldn't believe how fast it was running. He immediately got on the phone, his cell phone and called his uh, dad and his son to come over. And <laughs> he was too scared to get out of the, uh, out of the uh, tree stand. He wouldn't, in fact, they said they had to coax him to come out of it. He was so scared. Between the 70s and the present day, sightings have continued across the country. There might be more reports coming in now than at any point in history. From the deepest southern bogs to the rolling cornfields of the Midwest to the farthest reaches of the East Coast, hair-covered giant creatures are spotted by average people in ordinary places. While the creature's popularity continues to ascend as films, television shows, books, and podcasts propagate the subject, the being at the center of it remains ever elusive. I think the prevalence of these things in practically every state uh, is compelling, as opposed to them being isolated to one particular area. Uh, but because they they seem to be everywhere, you know, in stories not just in the United States but all over the world, uh, that there's some form of this thing practically everywhere. If you look at the global picture of hairy creatures, there's all kinds of different things. Bigfoot, Sasquatch are the same thing, but in the southern United States, they're more uh, hunched over, they're not as tall, uh, they're more aggressive, different things like that behaviorally that show us there's something else going on down in the south than there is in the Pacific Northwest and some of the more forested areas of the United States. I mean, obviously we both feel the same, I know this for a fact, we both feel the same way about this story as local history. It, it mm -hmm. should be preserved, it's very important to yes. Minerva, it's important to Stark County, Carroll County. Do you think there's an importance though? I mean, don't you feel in a way like this is the story that kind of put Bigfoot on the East Coast map? I, I do, I really do. Uh, in retrospect, yeah. And as I said, it wasn't even a thing then, but it uh, certainly became a thing later on. And uh, yeah, this was probably, the biggest East Coast or Midwest episode mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If I had my own misgivings on the subject, they might actually relate to Bigfoot's ability to exist in every state in the Union. After all, there aren't many creatures on this earth said to reside nearly everywhere. How does a 7 to 10 foot tall, 300 to 600 pound animal manage to stay as hidden in the cornfields of Illinois as it does in the darkened forests of Washington? I've been across the country on my journey to find the truth about the creature's existence, and I'm left with the simple fact that the only chance I might have of finding out if Bigfoot exists is to seek it out in the place it's most likely to live.